Five approaches to solve climate soon and profitably. Uh, in this is the following story I'll give it to you now. Uh, I worked on renewables and storage and solar since the 70s in the era of oil and burger, okay? And nothing much happened, even though climate came along and everybody's, you know, all worried about climate and increasingly. Nothing much happened with renewables and storage until the technologists reduced their cost below fossil carbon. And once that happened, it's gone bananas. And I'll relate a little bit of that, okay? Uh, my takeaway from this, okay, is that major changes like fixing climate or much of anything else only happen, they can happen fairly quickly if there's profit involved and industry executes. Otherwise, uh, it's up to government and everybody and his brother has got an oar in this water, okay? And it takes forever before government does it. And by that time, we're an extremist, okay? And those are the only two ways to do major changes. And, and doing major changes is hard because humanity has the amygdala, the part of our brain that keeps us conservative, okay? People hate change. Good change, bad, doesn't matter. People hate change. Okay, uh, I'm, you know, doing this talk to support Mark and his, one of his major themes for this meeting. Uh, this is the briefing for business folks that want to solve climate instead of playing with it. Uh, please hold your questions until the Q&A tomorrow or after this. Uh, I'm going to stay around tomorrow because uh, over these years, I've, uh, I've developed as a public utility for technology, okay? And, and so I consult for everybody for everything. Uh, <laughs> and, and, you know, so if you want to ask me something other than what I'm talking about, you know, tomorrow that's fine. Uh, all right. Uh, well, this is a quote, very recent, from the UN. The planet is on track for catastrophic warming unless countries take extreme action. Big changes. All right, climate is the existential societal issue of the age. For decades, we've been playing with the problem. We've not been willing to make the major changes at the scale and scope of the problem, which is huge, to solve it due to the perception that solving it required major near-term econometric losses instead of profits. Full stop. As a result, it's becoming rapidly much worse, not better. People are going around driving electric cars and doing all kinds of things, okay, figuring, oh, I'm solving climate, okay? What's happening to climate? There's more and more CO2. The water keeps rising and all kinds of other stuff. We're not having much effect on it, okay? Uh, it's becoming much worse and better. Uh, climate change is existential. It's far worse than most are aware of. And climate is becoming f uh, worse far faster than projected due to at least six positive feedbacks. Uh, you know, and I'm going to discuss several of them. But these positive feedbacks, in order to include them in the IPCC projections, need excellent scientific data. And we haven't supplied that yet, we the scientists of the world. Okay, so they're not in there. So the estimates of the effects of those that aren't in there yet is another factor or two on how bad it's going to be, at, you know, at a given date going forward. So it's worse. Uh, so there's global interest now only because people can now look out their door and window and see a change, see that it's climate effects, okay? Before this, no, and I'll go into the sad state of that. So the major concurrent societal existential threats are climate, AI, now, because we don't understand it, because it's doing emergent stuff that we don't understand, and we can't control what we don't understand, 
okay? And now AI runs almost everything, and they can decide to do something that can be not good. Uh, uh, the others are, are, are uh, solar storms, EMT, and the pandemics. Society doesn't just have climate to deal with, okay? And just the pandemic cost of COVID so far to the U.S. economy was $14 trillion, okay? These are not small problems we're talking about, okay? This is not something you pull around with. All right, climate impacts include the following serious temperature rise, floods, droughts, storms, disease, sea level rise, species extinction, ocean acidification, and ocean thermohaline circulation reduction, i.e. the Gulf Stream. And these are all occurring now with increasing severity. The ocean thermohaline circulators are slowing now f much faster than anybody thought. This is due to the fact that there's less cold water and, uh, and uh, saline changes between the Arctic and, and Antarctic and, and uh, the equator. Uh, and large effects on this slowing are expected now by 2025 to 2030. Uh, so climate is no longer decades away, okay? We can't duck this problem anymore. All right, when the thermohaline circulators died the last time seriously, it happened in the Permian extinction, which has been termed the great dying. It was a warming event caused by CO2 emissions from Siberian volcanoes, the Siberian traps, at 1% of the current human CO2 release, 1%, okay? And this happened. I'd like get this paper cleaned up here. Okay. Uh, with the Uh, the oceans, when the thermohaline circulators slowed down, went anoxic, low oxygen, because it doesn't have the circulation to put the oxygen in the water. And due to these ocean circulation reductions, that enabled the overgrowth of algae, cyanobacteria, which produced hydrogen sulfide gas, which is poisonous in the atmosphere in parts per million which resulted in 90% combined land and ocean species extinction, along with taking down the ozone layer, okay? So climate is much more than warm days and wet feet. A sixth mass extinction, mass extinction is now forecast. One sixth of the population lives off the water from the Hamalian glaciers, which are going away fast. What are they gonna drink? The aquifers in the U.S. are drying up, in the Great Plains and Southwest especially. The major characteristics of the climate problem are its immense scale, scope of impacts, and their severity. And most approaches, why we haven't been able to make much headway, most approaches do not scale to this size of the problem. Projected world costs of climate are now 51% of global GDP in this century. This is nothing to play with. However, transitioning to a low carbon economy would produce 26 trillion globally and 65 million new jobs by 2030. Also, the many positive feedbacks, one of them is the massive release of fossil CO2 from the tundra and, and, and methane. And, and the methane release is from the melting of methane hydrate. This is the ice that burns that's in the tundra and in the oceans. There's enough of this methane hydrate off the Carolinas, okay, huge mountains of it, so if it was disturbed, causing an undersea landslide, there would be a tidal wave that would be very destructive on the Atlantic coast. Uh, the tundra is warming four times faster than the rest of the planet, because the ice is going away, so the sun comes in. And methane is 36 times worse than CO2 for climate forcing. 
uh, uh, this and other positive climate feedbacks are not included in the projections uh, because we don't have the data. So the bottom line is the scale, breadth, and cost of climate are such that it's an existential problem societally and economically today. However, business people, this is now an existential issue with massive markets. Okay? This is going to be one of the best economic opportunities that you've ever had and I'm going to feed you five top line you know, ways to go after it and another eight which are really good honorable mentions. Okay, uh, what, what held up serious climate mitigation efforts includes the innate tactical nature of society because of the amygdala and so forth. Uh, China's planning cycle is a thousand years. Japan is 140 years. The U.S. planning cycle is the next quarter on Wall Street to the four-year presidential cycle. <laughs> okay? Climate development has taken many decades, which is way more than the five-year cycle for, for industry in this country. And therefore, we didn't do anything with it, hardly, until we looked out the window and said, oh, hell, the water's rising. Okay? We waited too long. It's gotten too bad. Now that the impacts are readily apparent, there's increasing motivation now to take action and therefore much more markets. There are still concerns about the adverse, you know, econometric effects of taking action, losses, not profits, especially with respect to fossil fuels. The renewables and storage replacements are now decimating fossil fuels and also nuclear. Nuclear is the most expensive energy that, that, that you can supply, okay? Coal is next, then there's oil, and then there's all the renewables now, okay? That's why the renewables are growing very, very rapidly. Climate conditions are now approaching raw survival, but they can be successfully approached as I'm going to discuss. A climate mitigation approaches include reducing the generation of CO2. Everybody's been saying, oh, we got to get the CO2 down. Yes, we do. The problem is we have let climate get so bad that we got to do a lot of other stuff at the same time. That's not going to be enough anymore. We need to reduce the CO2 presence in the atmosphere and also methane. We need to reduce energy use and do some geoengineering that makes sense, that won't take the climate down, uh, I mean, the, the planet down. And all of these need to be pursued concurrently. That means if we're going to happen, they all need to be profitable. And that's what I'm going to discuss. <clears throat> uh, several climate mitigation approaches which have been suggested are probably not good. With, Many have the possibility of, of major adverse unintended effects. These include for geoengineering, cost, scale, and adverse effects. We scientists have very little idea what would happen once we start doing this geoengineering, and we've only got one planet to experiment with. We can't mess this up. Okay, for fission and fusion nuclear, you hear a lot about that. All right, the nukes are you know, try to stay in business because, because they're closing, because they're so expensive, okay? Uh, but fission and fusion nuclear have huge cost, huge cost, latency. You could never build enough of them to, to do much on, on the climate. It takes far too long. And all their waste issues. And, and you know, by the way, if you talk to me tomorrow, I'll tell you a solution to that. Uh, and the cost, scale, and leakage for non-bio CO2 sequestration, which we're now starting into, which is very expensive and, and without much, much capacity. Okay, now I'm ready to uh, tell you what you want to hear. Uh, five suggested approaches, the major ones. The first is a new energy source, which is projected to be wholly green, smaller, cheaper than the renewables and storage, with many more direct applications, 
and provide distributed generation up to megawatts at your home. Next is a way via bio to, to uh, sequester four gigatons of carbon per year. And that's about the, the, the increase per year that humans put in the, uh, uh, the atmosphere. Uh, and and in, the, in the process of, of doing that sequestration, you can also make major favorable changes to land, water, food, and energy. That's the second one. Then there's three more where I give you technologies to increase markets that are ready working climate, but what I'm going to discuss would allow you to go in and, and, and overarch those. And then I'm going to talk about eight early days yet frontiers. All right, the first one, there's a new nuclear weak force battery without radiation emissions. Okay, so it's perfectly safe. There's four basic forces in physics, the nuclear strong force, fission fusion, the weak force, radiologics, which this battery is, electromagnetics, and gravity. This battery exhibits the classic weak force characteristic of producing 10,000 times more energy than burning something, i.e. hydrogen in your car. You can go 10,000 times farther on the same amount of hydrogen. Okay? Uh, or not only in your car, but in your ship or your airplane and so forth. It's small, compact, scalable to nearly a megawatt thus far. It's Japanese. Over a decade, the Japanese invested serious funding and top government, industry, and university talent and learned how to scale low energy nuclear reactions. Which in over 30 years of research and the rest of the planet, no others had been able to do. The Japanese company is called Clean Planet. It's building a two kilowatt device for commercial use for the shelves of Walmart in a couple of years. That, a couple of those will run your house, it'll run your car, so forth and so on. And they're developing a 600 kilowatt device so they can scale it up to megawatts. Once this thing has an operating temperature, evidently the internal IR can keep the generation process running. And therefore, the COP, the coefficient of performance, the ratio of output to input stuff, uh, is, is uh, up to, uh, 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 infinity, because you don't have to put it in. Uh, it uses regular hydrogen and nickel, very small amounts of both, which are readily available and not expensive. Due to very favorable cost, scaling, and energy density, it appears to be capable of solving climate, providing electric transportation with arbitrary range, Distributed energy generation at point of use, cheap water desalinization, powering buildings, manufacturing, agriculture, the whole thing at point of use. What I'm going to end up telling you for several reasons is central generation at grids may not be the future. So this is overall inexpensive energy generation with unique characteristics, much lower footprint, and weight and cost than other green options. Uh, and this could lead to getting rid of the grid and produce an energy rich society. And, and currently, this company, Green Planet, has 74 patents in 22 countries and has a global launch schedule in 25 26. So if you want to get in on that, you go speak Japanese and go talk to them. All right, the second one is halophytes. Halo means salt and phytes are plants. So these are salt plants. They're the other part of the plant kingdom. There's 6,000 of these plants that grow on deserts and wastelands. And deserts and wastelands are 44% of the land mass, and that's the land mass we're not using. So we can bring that into production, okay? And they grow using saline and seawater, 
which is 97% of the water. So cheap water, cheap land. Okay? Uh, <coughs> uh, halophytes mimic most of the freshwater plants, including food plants. There's halophyte tomatoes, halophyte rice, thanks to the Chinese. Quinola is a halophyte. Their cultivation involves cheap land, cheap water. Seawater provides 80% of the nutrients for plants, so minimal fertilizer. We have pulled so much fresh water out of the aquifers, including the Agawawa, the largest one in the world down in Texas and Oklahoma, that the water is becoming saline. We're salinating the arable land. We're going to have to go to halophytes anyway. For climate, halophytes sequester in their deep desert roots 18% of their CO2 uptake, pulling at scale 4 gigatons of CO2 out of the atmosphere and, and just redlining where it is climate. Okay. Uh, such, such cultivation would produce massive amounts of food, biomass, and biofuels and can profitably literally green the planet using available technology and rapidly. The halophyte biomass would replace petroleum for petrochemical feed. Half of the petroleum that, that we bring up goes to petrochemical feedstock. You can use biomass for that. Okay? A switch to halophytes for food can save increasing portions of the 70% of the fresh water we're running out of, which is now used to grow your food. Okay? So if you grow food with salt water, you get the 70% back and there's no more water problem. Overall, halophytes solve land, water, food, energy, and climate rapidly at scale and produce major profits. Uh, I did some briefs on this over in Europe and in the Near East to people with a lot of money. And the first thing they did the next day was call me up and want me to go over there and run one of major projects in this thing. Uh, Boeing is growing halophytes now for green fuels for aircraft. You can green Death Valley with this stuff. That's how powerful it is. Okay, third one. Renewables and storage. This is on to what Mark is interested in. Uh, now the current renewables and storage options are, besides his beloved uh, photovoltaic solar stuff, uh, uh, on and offshore wind solar thermal, geothermal, hydro, and biomass. Uh, uh, I went through the story of why nothing happened uh, with uh, the uh, renewables until their, their, their costs went below parity for fossil fuels. Their costs with storage have dropped 85% in these last years. Massive drops. Once serious profits were available, and there's been a rapid shift to renewables, they are now up to 91% of the new generation for electricity. And as we use more of it, starting to mitigate climate. Right now, 36% of the electricity on this planet is generated uh, by the renewables. Uh, going forward, the renewables and storage would drop further in cost. Everybody's doing research on the renewables to, to, you know, to affect this. That, all right, what I'm now going to go through is a brief laydown of ways that you can corner the photovoltaics market. Okay? Use any and all of these piece parts. The, the first one is utilize more of the solar spectrum. Right now, most of the PV only use a little bit. Produce two electrons per photon. Okay? The scientists have figured out how to do that. That'll double it. Okay? Uh, regeneration, because right now, 75% of the solar energy goes into heat instead of electricity. All right? You can regenerate that. We've got all kinds of ways to, to turn heat into electricity. Uh, you can add, add IR to the bottom of the PV to look to the ground so that at night you can take the heat from the ground, so-called earth shine, and still keep generating electricity. Uh, you can use solar concentrators, which reduce the area coverage that you need. 
and it enables the use of a, of a tailored PV with higher efficiency. You can work panel cleanliness, which is not a small problem. Control of the operating temperature, lower is better. Tandem multiple junction cells, which are twice as efficient. Anti-reflection coatings. Track the suns and use ultra-thin films and stuff like windows and so forth. Okay? So Mark's exactly right. Okay? There's huge markets out there in this stuff. But you've know, but you got to go in and do something other than silicon, all right, because the Chinese have got that pretty well caught up. Overall factors are two to three times efficiency are, uh, are available. The best land optimization for putting PV is over water resources so that you stop the water evaporation and also put it over farmland because we found out that plants grow fine under PV. Storage costs have also plummeted, they're still dropping. People are now uh, they're putting in use iron air batteries that are 90% less costly than, than the silicon iron. The Australians have found out that there's 530,000 pumped hydro storage sites worldwide. And if the fluid that you're pumping up and down is a higher density, higher specific gravity, then you don't need as much height to get the same energy. Uh, the redox batteries are coming online. Solar PV and wind require storage, but solar thermal does not. High altitude wind does not, geothermal does not, and biomass, they're either base load or self storage. Renewables plus storage are now cheaper than a gas peaker plant, and therefore gas is the next uh, one to come down. There's now some, if you're into geoengineering, three and a half million abandoned oil and gas wells in the US, which folks are starting to convert to geothermal energy generation very effectively. It turns out the hole in the ground is half the cap capability cost to set up in business. Next one, conservation and efficiency. The projected impacts of conservation efficiency and energy loss are massive. The projections are 44% reduction in the energy you use by 2040 and 60% by 2050. This approach has already flattened out the energy growth curve, which used to be going like this, and now it's almost flat. These approaches are cutting consumers' energy bills, which is where the markets are, and mitigating climate, starting to, and in the process, creating major markets for enabling products and approaches. There's now buildings that generate energy instead of using it. A very good friend of mine started building these things a couple of years ago, and he just can't keep in for it. Uh, I mean, you know, these things are falling off the shelves if buildings can do that. Uh, manufacturers are switching to electrification for econometrics because it's much cheaper energy and, and the equipage is, is much cheaper. Electric motors use the greatest share of the energy and their efficiency is up by 30%. The ongoing shift of to, to, in the virtual age to tell everything, telework, tell shopping, tell education, tell medicine, tell commerce, Teleshopping, okay, these are reducing much the energy in the CO2. Teleshopping is a factor of 15 less CO2 than calling up Amazon, okay? Uh, all right, uh, uh, electric motors are twice as efficient as the best thermodynamic fuel cycles. Personally, not too long ago, I reappliance my house completely, including the, uh, the heat pumps, with what's available now, and cut my electric bill in half. Okay? The markets, people love this stuff. Distributed energy generation. Historically, we've used central power plants and a grid to distribute electric energy and transported fuels to distribute chemical energy to and, and, and for point of use. The electric grid is costly, particularly now that, that you have to pay to make a smart grid so that you can buy the energy being produced by the next guy's roof. Okay? 
Uh, the grid has energy losses, which are not small, and is extremely vulnerable to storms and solar storms. The solar storms are the problem. These couple to the grid cause surges and knock out the big transformers with a three to four year delivery date, and they're no longer made in the US. And that cuts out electricity if it's a central system. Electricity is the life's blood of society. Never has a society produced such a massive vulnerability as our 100% total dependence on electricity and electrons. There's a recent congressional committee, the EMP Commission, that studied this and concluded in their report that a good solar storm coupling to the grids would result in massive societal disruption and massive loss of life in just one year because there is no food, there is no transportation, there is no medicine, there is no nothing. Within a year, we lose our societal consilience, start eating each other, <laughs> and their projection of US mortality in a year is 91%. Okay? Now, the solution to this is that the renewables, due to favorable scaling, are now providing distributed energy generation, rooftop solar and storage, as well the Japanese battery, as do other things. Okay? And with those, there's no coupling to the grid from the solar storms. You're good. In the last Puerto Rican hurricane, the, the, uh, uh, the on-site solar stuff kept working right to the hurricane, and, and the central stuff all went down for a long time. Overall, these huge efficiencies, cost savings, and public health and safety benefits associated with switching to distributed generation, replacing the grid going forward. This is a huge, rapidly growing market, particularly in, in, in uh, Europe. The PV rooftop payback time keeps reducing, and PV now comes in shingles. All right, no more things on the rooftop. OK, honorable mentions. High altitude jet stream wind, 30,000 feet, always blowing and blowing hard, so small windmills up there. The greatest capacity in the world is off the U.S. East Coast. The capacity of, of high altitude wind is twice the U.S. installed grid power. Okay. There's a lot of energy up there. Uh, and the people who have looked at, at how much it would cost, it turns out their estimates were cheaper than the renewables, the other renewables. All right, this one's important. This is one geoengineering thing that I think would work well. As we've lost the ice, we're losing the planetary reflectivity albedo, and, and that's causing an awful lot of the temperature increase. White roofs and white roads. The impact of society is now so massive on the countryside, okay, that if we bought a lot of white paint, so you know, manufacturing white paint is a good thing to be in too, okay? And, and, and just painted the roofs and, 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 and uh, roads white, we could delay climate a decade. That's good. Okay, one of my patents, I've got a bunch of them, is a new nuclear battery. This one's got radiation called NTEC, which is a factor of 30 lighter than a nuclear reactor. But what's nice about it is you can open the intake, you can take a coal shovel, and shovel in the nuclear waste, and there's enough nuclear waste around, which still has 85% of the energy, to generate energy on the grid for 100 years. Okay? The only reason why it's not in the top five is, you know, I was, it's mine, so I didn't want to do that. But, 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 but uh, also, uh, uh, I want to make sure that it's cheaper than the renewables and storage. All right? The U.S. has huge nuke waste. Uh, uh, we don't know where to put it. We we're going to put it in Yucca Mountain. You know, then we discovered water, so the price went up from $8 billion to $80 billion, and we stopped it. 
Uh, so it's in the individual reactors, whether they're working or not. The government owns it. The government has to pay them to store it there, okay? And, and it's a disaster from many angles that I can't discuss here because of classification. Uh, you know, and then there's more nuke waste than even in all the reactors from the weapons programs, okay? So all that nuclear waste, you know, we can be uh, generating energy from it. Fungi for CO2 sequestration. Fungi sequesters 80% of their CO2 uptake via symbiosis with plant roots. Fungi produces proteins and oils that you can sell. There's 3 million species. They now sequester 36% of the global fossil fuel CO2 we're putting out. Okay, which means that if it wasn't for fungi, we'd be a lot hotter. And they're a subterranean carbon bank. Air jet, nanoscale holes in material that generates electricity just from human air being around. Okay, nano uh, 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 air continuously uh, 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 circulates through, appears to scale well. It's another renewable that's base load, no storage, and no fuel. The last one is Q. It comes out of Stanford. Uh, and uh, an awful lot of the electric load now, as we get hotter, is air conditioning. So there's all that heat to deal with. And what these people discovered, <laughs> uh, you know, by, by looking through the standard text, uh, is that there's a a, uh, a part of the spectrum that you can radiate from the ground up to the cold of space right through the atmosphere, okay? And, and so they've got ways to do that for this heat from your air conditioner so you don't have to, uh, to uh, pay for doing that. Okay, those are honorable mentions. Bottom lines. The weak force nuke battery and halophytes proffer new climate solution approaches that are at scale, near term, inexpensive, and hugely profitable. Both constitute major societal and industrial economic changes, changes which are in line with the scale of the problem, finally. Uh, with the positive climate feedbacks kicking in, heading toward tipping points, climate is existential, and our current efforts are simply not effective at all. Even though you can go to the grid and say, you know, what can I do about climate? And there's long lists of 20 and 30 and 40 things that people do. And if everybody did them all, it won't help much. Okay? They're feel-good things. We need to both stop adding CO2 and methane and pull both out of the air at scale. To stop adding CO2 at scale is renewables plus storage plus the Japanese battery coming along later on. To stop adding methane work the anthropogenic sources like cows, and energy extraction, clean that up for methane. To stop the outgassing of heating the methane hydrate and the CO2 from the tundra in the oceans requires that you fix climate. There are no cheap ways to do that. To pull CO2 and methane out of the air at scale and profitably, land and sea halophytes is the answer. The land halophytes are, you know, I've already described, they solve land, water, food, energy, and climate, and sequester the four gigatons. The, uh, well, the one in the ocean is ocean fertilization. Oh, I just had an article in the New York Times on this. Great fun. Uh, it, it turns out that if you add the right type of iron-rich dust via ships and large fans of deserts blowing out over the oceans, we've learned what that can do from the ice cores that tells us what's in the atmosphere before the last ice age. And there was a factor of five to six more iron-rich dust in the atmosphere than there was then. And there was vanishingly less CO2 and methane in the atmosphere, okay? Well, how does this work? Well, it turns out that uh, uh, the, the, the CO2 fertilizes algae. We have dumped this stuff overboard for, from ships and looked with the overheads and what happens, and there's this huge algae bloom. 
And a couple of years later, there's this huge fish population increase from eating the algae. Okay, so you can sell both. Uh, and it uh, reduces the methane because it provides chloride oxidation of methane, turning into CO2, and then the algae takes care of it. Most of the current climate mitigation activities are not at scale, are ineffective, mainly been playing with the problem, and many of the approaches were cost, not profit centers. If we want to solve this thing, we've got to start doing it with profit-making stuff. Doing it fast, doing it large, expeditiously. All right, my, my email is dennisb557 at gmail.com. That's dennisb557 at gmail.com. I'll be here tomorrow to answer questions or discuss whatever you want or email me. As I said, I'm a public utility for a lot of stuff. Uh, oh, by the way, I have worked powered energy for 30 years for the National Intelligence Council. Uh, we can probably do some Q&A now, depending on how much of my time I've used up, probably too much. And my ears are as old as the rest of me, so folks might have to repeat the question. Thank you. Thank you.